Dolphin populations for 47, years. for 47 years, and he was my graduate school advisor. So, uh, he out okay. <laughs> yeah, I owe a lot to him. So, uh, put your hands together for uh, Dr. Randy Wells. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joss, and, and thank you all for coming out today. What I'd like to do is try to, to squeeze what we've learned in 47 years into less than 45 minutes. So, bear with me. Uh, we've got a small enough group that if we have questions as we go along, I'll be happy to take those. And if I know it's something that I'll talk about later on, then I'll let you know that. We'll just we'll move along. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So um, a lot of what we do in Sarasota Bay in studying the dolphins is observing them and taking photographs of them. And so sometimes we end up with a photograph like this. Great picture, cute dolphin, baby poking its head out of the water. And that by itself is great, but there's just so much more that can come from a cute picture. We know every individual in that photograph, and we know that from long-term studies of these animals that we've been looking at since 1970. We know, for example, that this is Nick Lowe based on the, the shape of her dorsal fin with a cutoff tip and a low nick down here. We know that this is Eve. You can't see it, but there's a notch on her fin that we can recognize. There's a lead notch here and another notch back here for black tip, double dip. And this baby is her brand new baby, and we've seen them in close association. So from a photograph like this and from long-term studies, there's a lot of information that can be derived. First of all, the dolphins in Sarasota Bay have very long lifespans. This particular photograph was taken in 2012. That would make Nick Lowe 62 years old back then. Her associate, Black Tip Double Dip, was 59 years old back then. Her daughter um, was 14 years old in, in 2012. But long lifespans are something that we've been able to learn about in Sarasota Bay just because we've been out there for a long time. We've learned that there's long-term, year-round residency to the coastal waters. And by the coastal waters, what I mean is a home range that these animals occupy that goes from Teresia Bay and the Manatee River around Anna Maria Island southward to Venice and all the inshore waters. And that is the home range of a resident community of animals. We um, get a sense that probably Nick Lowe has been around all of her life, although we've not been studying for that long. But these animals are seen year-round in these waters. We know that there are multiple concurrent generations of dolphins out there. We've been studying these animals since 1970. At any given time, we can be observing as many as five concurrent generations. Not we've observed serially five generations over 47 years, but at any given time. The relationships within the community are complex and long-lasting. In this particular photo, we have Nick Lowe as the grandmother, her daughter Eve, who is the mother of F-286, who we now know as a grandson. And we note there's complex social structure and communication that goes on out there. And this comes from observational studies and other communication studies we've been able to perform that I'll talk a little bit about today. So it was a cute picture, but there's so much more than just a cute picture shown in here in terms of what it epitomizes about the local dolphin community. And now a word from our sponsors. Uh, we are a soft money program. We have to go out and find grants and contracts and donations to be able to do the work. And so these are the main groups that have been supporting us over the most recent years for doing this work. Today what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about the history of our long-term research program, how we study the animals, what we found with regards to residency, their biology and reproduction, and their social structure. And I'm going to focus on conservation. Uh, this has to deal with the natural threats, the human threats, how we try to deal with those, and how these animals can benefit other animals in other places through education and, and other field efforts. So this is a dolphin we know as Killer. She is as old as our program. She was born in 1970. 
She's also the most frequently seen dolphin in our program. We've seen her over 1,500 times since 1975. Over the years, we've learned, we've observed her with nine different calves since 1982. Five of those are still alive. Um, then those are Lizzie Borden, Lorena Bobbitt, Freddy Krueger, Vader. There's a theme there, and we can talk about that later on, how that came about. Um, but try to come up with 5,000 names. It's challenging. Those five calves have produced seven grand calves, of which four are still surviving. These are all the locations we have for killer, from the mouth of the Manatee River up around Passage Key, southward down to Siesta Key, and especially in these inshore waters. So how do we know this kind of information about these animals? First of all, we started a long, long time ago. We began with a pilot study to tag dolphins when I was at Moat Marine Laboratory and I was a high school research assistant. I worked with this fellow named Blair Irvine who was doing research at Moat at the time and had an interest in what dolphins do in local waters. At that point, nobody knew whether dolphins that were seen in Sarasota Bay on any given day would be there the next day or the next week, or whether they'd be in Texas or Mexico or Cuba or in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. There had been no systematic studies of the movement <coughs> patterns of dolphins. So Blair brought his interest in what wild dolphins do, and we went out and we were able to tag some of the local dolphins. We began to get a sense in 1970 and 71 that some of these animals were resident to the area. We worked in the area from Tampa Bay southward to Charlotte Harbor, and we especially focused in the Sarasota Bay area. And in here, as you know, we have the abyssal depths of Sarasota Bay that go all the way down to 12 feet, and then these shallows that the dolphins use extensively all around in the, in the open coastal waters. We came back in 1975 and 1976 to tag more dolphins and learn more about these individuals. At that point, we were able to recapture and, and tag 11 of the 12 dolphins we'd first marked in 1970 and 1971. So we began to get confirmation of residency and long-term residency during that time. Continuing from that point forward, we were able to work with others around the world to develop the use of natural markings as a way of keeping track of individual dolphins. We didn't have to put tags on them to tell them apart, and the tags didn't work very well anyway. But we began to use nicks and notches to tell the animals apart. And this is a very distinctive fin. This is one of Killer's kids um, right here. But you can see the nicks and notches on the trailing edge, and this one even has one on the leading edge, that with a good quality side-on photograph can tell you who that individual is with a high degree of reliability. We've been able to observe Lorena Bobbitt more than 900 times based on these notch patterns since 1999. And they serve basically as fingerprints to tell the animals apart. 96% of the dolphins in the Sarasota Bay Area are recognizable to us. Over the years, we've amassed a sighting database of more than almost 49,000 dolphin groups. We have over 700,000 photographs archived from which we can derive our identifications. Within these photographs, we've been able to make 147,000 individual identifications. We've been able to support the optometrists of Sarasota Manatee counties to a great extent because we've had to look at an awful lot of photographs to do that, and we all wear glasses. <laughs> we have more than 5,300 identifiable dolphins in our catalog from the central west coast of Florida, not just Sarasota, but from about Clearwater on southwards to Sanibel Island or a little bit south, offshore to about five to 10 miles in all the inshore waters. And as I said before, we have as many as 1,500 sightings of a given individual, the one we've seen the most being killer. So this works quite well for us. It's not nearly as easy as sitting in your air-conditioned Land Rover and taking photographs of animals that are standing in front of you with nice, unique paint jobs. But we've gotten to the point where we can get pretty good photographs of these animals that allow us to come up with our identifications quite readily. So what have we learned from this? Number one take-home message, we have multi-generational, multi-decadal, year-round residency to the area. This is their home, much like it's home for all of us. I refer to the dolphins as being in our backyard, but I think I've got it wrong. They've been here longer, we're in their backyard. And we are fortunate to be able to make use of their home, but it is their home first and foremost out in the bays. The community of Sarasota Bonanose Dolphins resides in the waters from southern Tampa Bay, southward down to Venice, and it's not in isolation. There are 
adjacent communities to the north and to the south. There's four different communities that we've identified up in Tampa Bay. There's at least one other community along the Gulf here. We're still trying to pin that one down, but we have some residency over at least 30 years out there. And then there are other communities to the south of Sarasota as well. It's a mosaic of these resident communities up and down the central west coast of Florida. We currently have about 160 dolphins that use Sarasota Bay on a, re on a regular basis. I refer to this as a community rather than a population. In a biological sense, a true biological sense, a population is a closed reproductive unit. And our genetic studies indicate that this is not a closed unit at all. There is outbreeding going on. There's mixing going on with other communities. So the community gives it a sense of the fact that it's built on associations and ranging patterns as opposed to genetic isolation. A lot of the animals have been here for a long time. 96% of those that are at least 15 years old have been here for at least 15 years. We've been able to determine over time that males can live to 52 years, and we have a female out there that's 67 years old at this point, and we hope she keeps going for a long time. We can look at the age and sex distribution here just on average for the community, and we see that with five-year increments down here, blue for boys, pink for girls, yellow for unknowns, in the first five years of life, things are tough for these animals. Getting through the first year of life can be a challenge for them, but if they make it through that, then they're good for the next couple of years as they're being reared by mom. But when they leave mom at three to six years of age, that's another time when we see increased mortality. And then when they reach sexual maturity between five and 10 years of age, it's another time when we see increased mortality. But once they get to that point, then we don't lose very many during any given year. And we get into what is dolphin old age out here. I can't give you an average lifespan because we've not followed the whole cohort from birth until death. But I can let you know that 67 is a really old age. It'd be equivalent to 100 and something for a human being. We should not expect dolphins to live that long in general. But it, it does give you some sense of what the bounds might be. The 52, the males have it tougher than the females do, and we'll talk about some of the possible reasons for that. Among the things that we do, in addition to the photographic identification, where we go out and keep track of the individuals, we're going out and looking at them 10 days every month to keep track of their status in the population or in the, in the region. But from time to time, we'll also go out and perform a health assessment to get a sense of the status of the local community and to collect data that can be used for comparison to other communities as well. And this involves encircling small groups of dolphins in shallow water and doing health workups on a, a specially designed boat that we have here. We take measurements and samples. We do a complete physical examination with veterinarians on board. We use ultrasound to look at the condition of the organs of the animals. We use ultrasound to look at their reproductive status. Are they pregnant? Are they mature? We get body condition indications. We look at how well their lungs are functioning. Uh, we look at how well their hearing is functioning using the same tests that are used on infant human beings because one of the biggest threats facing dolphins and whales in the wild is noise from human activities, whether it's Navy sonar, whether it's industrial activities, oil and gas exploration, um, or just shipping noise. It's one of the biggest threats to marine mammals in the world. We obtain samples to put together health profiles based on um, uh, chemistry and hematology and blood gases. We look at the presence or absence of various microorganisms. We look at immun immunological status in a variety of things, including environmental contaminants, which made Jocelyn happy when it was time for her to do her master's thesis and uh, get a variety of, of samples and measurements for the animals before releasing them right on site. So, no, I'm sorry, the screen's not, not optimal, but that's okay. Um, what we've been able to learn by looking at these animals and knowing who they are and knowing how old they are and knowing who they're related to is a sense of the social structure in Sarasota Bay. And Sarasota Bay was the first place the bottlenose dolphin social structure could be described. What we've learned over time is that these animals live in what we call a fission-fusion society. The groups are changing composition frequently. I envision the community range as being a neighborhood, and the individuals in the neighborhood are moving around and meeting up with other neighbors from time to time, saying hello, having coffee, then they go off and meet up with another neighbor. The groups are not permanent. If they were permanent groupings, they'd be a pod. Pods are very stable groupings, like what you find killer whales living in, where they just don't change composition. 
But those peas can't move out of that pod. Killer whales stay within their pods. Our dolphins are constantly changing their groupings. So bottlenose dolphins and most dolphins do not live in pods, they live in groups. They don't live in families, like the humans tend to envision families. It's not mom, dad, and the kids. All the dads are deadbeats by definition. Okay, they impregnate the female, then they're off finding other females elsewhere. So what we see are a variety of basic groupings that can change in specific composition over time. On average, we see four to seven individuals together, but it can go anywhere from a single individual up to more than 30, rarely up to 30. And it's the groups are made up of nursery groups, which are mothers with their most recent offspring, juvenile groups, which are those that have recently left their mothers and are in groups with other juveniles. And then we have adult males. Once the males reach sexual maturity, they'll form a pair bond with another male and those winged dolphins will remain together throughout the lifespan of, of one of them. We've been able to use paternity testing to, to try to identify the patterns of, of paternity for the local dolphins in much the same way that we do it for human beings. It's blood tests. We exclude all the potential fathers that don't make the match, and what we're left with is probably dad. And so in the case of Killer, um, these are a number of her calves for which we've been able to determine who the dad is. And these are the different fathers. And you'll notice that she uses different fathers most of the time. She liked this guy a lot. She used him twice. Um, and she liked this guy, but so did her daughter. And so they both had, now there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong, it's just fine. They both used him to produce kids. So I, I don't even want to try to say what the relationship is between these kids at this point. I can't put a name on it. But there is no monogamy going on, or if anything, it's serial monogamy. The males are with the females during their period of receptivity, and then they're off doing something else. So these males, they form this strong pair bond that I mentioned before. It happens within a year of the time they reach sexual maturity, and then it can last for decades. And it's the kind of thing where at any given time, 57% of our males will be in a pair bond. The others will be in transition. They will have lost a buddy, or they'll be acquiring a buddy at that point. Over the course of a lifetime, males, 90% of the males will have had a buddy. And it's one of the strongest relationships you'll find in the animal kingdom in terms of the, the strong pairing between these not necessarily related males. The advantages that come from being a part of a partnership like that are reproductive. They can work together to fend off other males from a receptive female. Protection, they can one can remain vigilant while the other one is resting and fend off potential attacks by predators or battles with other males. They can work together to capture fish. They can work together to fight off other males under a variety of other circumstances as well. But it is a very strong feature and a very interesting feature of the social system and something that was discovered here in Sarasota Bay first. So our long-term study has allowed us to define the life history parameters for these animals. Sexual maturity. Females reach sexual maturity based on hormone concentrations and based on um, when we observe pregnancies occurring at about five to 10 years of age. Males, if it was humans, I'd say they never reach maturity, but we're talking dolphins, and we can say that 10 years of age is about when the males reach sexual maturity um, in most circumstances. Most of the calves are born during May to July. We've seen calves born every month of the year except for December and January. The gestation is 12 and a half months. With our ultrasound, we've been able to identify pregnancies during the health assessments and determine that 83% of those pregnancies go on to yield a happy calf living out there with mom. And keep that number in mind, we'll talk about another situation later. The mothers are anywhere from six to 48 years of age. They can become pregnant as early as five, but that's rare. And we've had several females that have given birth at 48 years of age. It gives the population a huge amount of resilience to have a wide range of ages over which females can reproduce. We've observed females with a series of up to 10 calves so far, and those females that have, gotten, have produced 10 calves are not at this 48-year stage yet. Typically, they'll invest three to six years in each calf. They've usually weaned the calf nutritionally by the time they're one and a half to two years old, but then there's a period of learning. It takes a lot to learn how to be a dolphin and make a living out there in the wild. 
And so that period of learning is what extends it out to three to six years. The fathers are anywhere from 10 to 40 years old, and we've seen males produce up to six calves so far. But we're just completing some additional paternity analyses, and we'll be able to say more soon. The social structure is very complex for these animals. There are patterns of association that go beyond just the basic ones that I talked about. Certain individuals have preferred associates. They communicate with each other in complex ways that we're just beginning to learn about. We're able to study their behavior by doing what's called focal animal behavioral observations. And what this means is that there will be somebody in an observation tower on one of our boats watching the dolphins. And at specific time points, they'll record the behavior of that animal at that given time. That way, you're not just recording every exciting thing that's happening out there, but you're doing it in a systematic way that allows you to put perspective to what the animals are doing. We've been able to study the social structure in that way and also look at the communication patterns of the animals. During the health assessments, we'll record the sounds that they're producing with these little suction cup microphones. And we'll engage in playback studies, where there'll be recorded sounds played back to a dolphin that's being held. And we'll look at how that dolphin responds to that. And it's in studies like this that we were able to determine with our colleagues from the Sea Mammal Research Unit in Woods Hole that dolphins have something that's called a signature whistle. It's an individually specific whistle. Each individual dolphin develops its own whistle from the time it's about three months old. And that actually is that animal's name. It responds when its whistle is called. It uh, gives off its own whistle to let other dolphins know where it is. And the idea of an abstract concept like a name existing in the animal kingdom is very unusual. But the experiments have shown that these animals do use these whistles as their name. They produce a huge variety of other whistles. And we're just now trying to learn what those mean. But an important starting point was knowing that they have ways of calling each other and keeping track of one another. One of the ways we're able to study them is with this little D tag, this digital archival tag. It's a little computer attached with suction cups. And it records all the sounds that reach it, either from the animal itself or from its environment. And it stays on for about a day. And then it pops off, and it's got a radio transmitter in it. And it floats at the surface. You go pick it up and download it. In this way, you can get a sense of what the dolphins are saying and what they're facing in terms of noise in the environment without there being any influence of people around or any, any boats around. And it's doing a tremendous amount of teaching us about what it takes to be able to be a communicating dolphin in this environment. We try to put the animals into perspective relative to their ecology as well. We know the dolphins don't live in isolation. So we've gone to great lengths to try to understand what it is that keeps these dolphins supported. And so in 2004, we began a study that involves seasonal purseining, going out into the wild and catching fish in seagrass meadows and quantifying the availability of fish of various kinds, identifying the species, measuring them, and then releasing them right back over the side. And in this way, we can keep track of the relative availability of, of fish and how that affects the movements and behavior and health of the dolphins. We know what they eat through observations when they're at the surface, and it's not hard to find them near the surface in the shallows we have around here. We know from stomach contents of stranded dolphins what they eat. We know from observations from this thing. Um, there was a helium-filled airship uh, aerostat that was connected to a little houseboat with a video camera suspended from it. Nowadays, they would call it a drone. But back in the 90s, we didn't have those. This is the best that we had. And it was ungainly, uh, but it got us looking down into the water column. You can't see much horizontally, but you can see a lot vertically. And it allowed us to see what the animals are doing when they're not at the surface. And with hydrophones in the water, we could hear what they were doing at the same time. And it, it allowed us to learn a great deal about these animals. What we learned is that a lot of the fish that the animals eat are connected to seagrass meadows and mangroves. And so when we see habitat destruction, when we see shoreline destruction, when we see loss of mangroves and seagrass meadows, this is a major impact on the dolphins locally, as well as the fish they're eating. We've identified a variety of fish that these animals eat. The number one food item is pinfish, and that's one of the most common fish that are out there. That's basically the rice. Then they are selective about the fish that they take. They tend to prefer to take fish that make noise, what we refer to as soniferous fish. And the reason for them taking these disproportionate to their availability of the environment is basically because it's easier. 
rather than having to use their sonar, which has the possibility of tapping the fish on the shoulder and say, hey, I'm looking at you, um, they can listen for the fish to make its own noise and they can zero in on that with their exceptional hearing and it allows them to just more easily get those meals. So toadfish are a big item, um, spot, pigfish, um, sea trout, ladyfish, these are all fish that they do take preferentially to others out there. But in terms of sheer numbers of fish, pinfish wins out. So the dolphins in our local community have faced a lot during their lifetime, and just even looking at Killer's lifetime, which pretty much mirrors my time in Sarasota. I moved here in 69, she was born in 70. We've seen that there's 3.4 times as many people as there were in 1970. There's 3.6 times as many boats. Things have changed a lot. Fortunately, the dolphins are still here. But some of the changes that you can see down in Sarasota, this is where Moat Marine Laboratory would be. Uh, this is 1939, many, many years later. And very little development, 1960, they were just starting to dredge up Bird Key, and this is what it looks like today. Huge numbers of changes, loss of productive areas, changes in current patterns, and yet the dolphins are still in the area. We try to, to study these animals from the time they're born till the time we die, and they die. Maybe as old as I am, the time I die. Um, but we understand these patterns of mortality for the animals because we work very closely with Moat Marine Laboratory's Stranding Investigations Program. They are responsible for picking up dolphins on the beach and bringing them back to Moat for necropsies and understanding what brought about the cause of death. They're also the ones that collect the samples from the stomachs to find out what the prey items are that these animals are focusing on. Work done by Moat indicated that um, for Sarasota Bay resident dolphins, a little bit more than half of the mortalities could be attributed to natural causes. A little bit less than a quarter couldn't be determined because the animals were just too decomposed. But a little bit more than a quarter of these mortalities were due to human causes. I'm with the Conservation Education and Training Group of the Chicago Zoological Society. The focus is on conservation. We focus on those things the humans are doing to try to reduce that and give the animals more degrees of freedom to be able to survive given all the things that they're facing out there in the world. And there's a lot of them. They can't choose which threat they're going to face at any given time. They have to deal with what's thrown at them at any given time. And so among the array of concurrent and cumulative threats that they face are disease processes, uh, failure to thrive for calves, biotoxins and the effects of, of harmful algal blooms on prey bases and on the animals themselves, hurricanes that can change the habitat dramatically, water temperature changes with uh, global climate change, exposure to predators, exposure to stingrays that can cause mortality, and then the human things, entanglement in nets, which no longer is much of an issue, and it never really was even when the commercial fishermen were more active. Um, Entanglement in crab traps, which has become more of an issue as more crab traps are out there. And then the threats that come from people not necessarily knowing that they're doing anything wrong. People feeding them because it's a fun thing to do, even though it's highly illegal. Or the biggest threat to the animals is entanglement in fishing gear, recreational fishing gear. But other threats that these animals face are threats from boat traffic that can lead to collision injuries or death, um, pollutants that are put into the area, noise in the underwater world and from construction and demolition and then other things we hadn't thought much about for Sarasota but are a possibility as we learned in Deepwater Horizon um, the threats from oil spill from the 4,000 or so rigs that are out in the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll talk about a few of these individually. Everybody is familiar with the fact that, that manatees are killed by boats. Uh, about 70 percent of manatees have been struck by boats. 70 percent of those have been hit more than once. It's a pretty awful thing. Many people don't think that dolphins get hit by boats, that it's not a worry because they're such nimble little beasts. And that would be so if all things were, cons were equal. But these animals go into very shallow water. And if they're in very shallow water, less than three feet deep, a dolphin is three feet tall from belly to the tip of the dorsal fin. It can't get below a boat in shallow waters. And with the advent of uh, personal watercraft and flats boats moving at high speed, these animals can't get out of the way. So we see about 5% of our dolphins that have been struck by boat propellers. Sometimes they live through it, like Pumpkin did or like Rip Torn did. Otter did not. 
Uh, the slices were just too deep. And then there's the disturbance aspect as well. We had a master's student who determined that there's a powerboat passing within 100 yards of every dolphin in Sarasota Bay once every six minutes. It's an urban area out there. It's, there's a lot of traffic. These dolphins modify their behavior as boats approach them. They form tighter groups. They, ch they dive deeper and longer. And they modify their whistling and their communication patterns. How much disruption can they take before the stress of that interferes with the energetics of the animals or with the, the health of the animals? So boats are a factor for these animals as they are for manatees, just not to the same degree. Entanglement in commercial gear, in fishing gear, has been an issue for these, these animals. In the past, there were some that were killed in, in local fishing nets, but not that many. We see more and more of them in crab trap entanglements. And you can see why when you look at the distribution of crab traps. With the cessation of inshore netting, many of the commercial net fishermen switched over to crab trapping. So now there are as many as 10,000 crab traps within the community range of the Sarasota dolphins during the winter time. And here's an indication of the distribution of those. Each one of them has their own individual float line. It's a maze swimming around out there. It takes manatees, it takes dolphins, it takes turtles. They get tangled up in the loose lines from that. And so it is a source of, of mortality and injury. We were fortunate a little bit over a year ago that we were able to get to one of our long-term resident dolphins and remove this crab trap line from him. He had been tangled up overnight off of Venice. and We were able to get to him in the morning. And I'll just show a little bit, if, assuming the video works, I'll show a little bit of that rescue process. It's a young adult male. Fortunately, it was calm overnight. Fortunately, a shark didn't take him out overnight. He was reported late at night, and Moat wasn't able to get out to him that night. But we got out there first thing and were able to, to get him. A really tired animal at that point. You shouldn't be able to get up next to them and pull their tail up like this. The person who first reported him cut the float off thinking that would help, but all they did was make it more difficult to find the animal. This is Aaron Barleycorn, my field coordinator. And this animal is incredibly passive. It's, this is a 500 pound dolphin that could just be beating the heck out of him right now. Fortunately, the wounds were not very deep. It was a pretty big, pretty big line in terms of diameter. And then he swims off. Note the pictures over here. I'll talk about them in a moment. Okay. All right, we're gonna try and keep up with them. Should I stop recording? No, keep recording. Try and track. Oh, there he is. And so he swims off just fine. Where was he at, Randy? He was off Venice. So along the borders of that photograph, I had some other pictures of another dolphin. That was his younger, younger sister. Six years ago, prior to that, to the day, she had been entangled in some kind of gear, plastic line wrapped around her head that had a metal hook, not a fish hook, but a metal hook attached to it. And we had to do a rescue on her. And Nellie's out there, she's doing great. The rescue was a success. But just to give you a sense of the dramas that go on within just even family lines within Sarasota Bay, there's a lot that these animals have to face. And so the biggest threat that we find to the local dolphins is from recreational fishing gear and to a lesser extent commercial fishing gear. But this calf had its tail almost cut off. This dolphin had fishing line migrating through its dorsal fin with algae attached to it that was dragging it further. It also had 30 wraps of line around one flipper that led to lesions. Um, we brought it into Moats Hospital and, and rehabbed it. This dolphin died from this lure. This calf had five different kinds of gear wrapped around it in its first few months of life. We were able to get the gear off, but it disappeared shortly after that. This dolphin, in her first six months of life down near Placida, she had boat propeller cuts in her tail, and she had fishing line caught in the boat propeller cuts, 
algae on the fishing line, which then help to saw the line farther and farther down. Mm -hmm. So it's not just one thing that these animals have to deal with. It's multiple things that they have to deal with, and some of them are well beyond their evolutionary experience. In this particular case, this mother died from a wrap of line around the pipe the, that connects the lungs to the blowhole and it was pulled tight and held in place by a hook that was in her forehead here. And so she strangled, but she had a hook here. Because she died, her six-month-old calf didn't survive. So you, that was a twofer. So that's one of the main things that these animals suffer from out in Sarasota Bay. During times when their prey is no, not as available as it usually is, we see an increase in the number of animals that are interacting with fishing gear. During the severe red tide of 2005-2006, more than 90% of the primary prey fish of the dolphins were gone. And during that time, we lost 2% of our local dolphin population to ingestion of fishing gear. Our hypothesis was that at that point, there were so few of the fish around that they normally ate it, that when they saw a happy, healthy bait fish or catch, it was just too much. And they went for that and they got entangled or, or ingested the fishing gear. But we did lose 2% uh, of our dolphins be during that period of red tide abundance. Sustaining this kind of interaction with fishermen is the behavior of boaters. Uh, there's been an increase in the number of human interactions between dolphins, uh, with dolphins since that 2004, 2000, or 2005, 2006 period in terms of the total number of individuals that are involved in human interactions and the number of new animals that are getting involved in human interactions. And we've been able to do analyses that have shown that if an animal gets involved with human interactions early on in life, it increases its chances of injury and mortality later on in life. There's a definite connection and a cost to the individuals within that, that community. So we work closely with others to try to enhance the controls or the, the outreach to let people know that this is a problem. Feeding wild dolphins is illegal under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Signs are posted that say that in various places. You can see how effective these signs are here as the people feed the dolphin over here. Same with billboards. They're up, but people tend to ignore them. Others feel that it's their right to be able to do whatever they want to, so they're training the ne next generation of violators here to feed wild dolphins. Others will just look you in the eye and say, I've been doing this my entire life, and I'm going to keep doing it. Um, all of it makes this much sense. Okay, These are wild animals. They know how to make a living on their own. Distracting them from being a wild animal can be a real problem. People say, well, what's the harm in giving him food? As one example, there was a case off the panhandle where some red snapper fishermen were catching undersized ones and throwing them back to a dolphin that was alongside their boat. As they were doing that, a mako shark came up and bit the tail off the dolphin and then came in and finished it off. The dolphin was not being a dolphin. It wasn't being alert, it wasn't being vigilant, it wasn't doing what normally would have protected it from engaging in that sort of thing. So we need the help of the public to get the word out about what these animals need. What we've learned over time, because we know these individuals so well, is that they learn from each other. And we have certain lineages that are more of a problem than our others. This is a dolphin that we know as Vespa, and she interacts with humans, she approaches boats. These are her calves, all eight of them. And every time you see a red circle, it means they engage in some activity that puts them at higher risk through human interactions. It's a lot of red circles there. Um, this is that little calf that I mentioned before that had the five entanglements. That was one of her calves. That was this one here. And then we go to a next generation, and we can now make this a red circle as well. But they pass this information along through observation. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay, I'm fine. Uh, so they pass this information along from generation to generation. And the only way we can counter that is by not giving them the opportunity to do it. Don't offer them the food. Don't fish where these animals um, are active. And so we've tried to come out and, and use public education of humans to counter dolphin education of each other. And we've done that in a variety of ways. It's talks like I'm doing now, books that we've put together. 
We've put together some friend dolphin friendly fishing and viewing tips in various formats. And these are positive ways, 10 positive ways that you can go out and enjoy the waters. We want you to enjoy the waters and appreciate the wildlife that's out there. But doing it in a responsible way that will reduce the possibilities of harm to the dolphins. And these are available out on the table. I'm turned around, out there. Um, and you're welcome to them. Uh, please put them to good use. We also have tried to get into other kinds of media. We've put together a 30 second public service announcement that hopefully I'll be able to play. For me, it started with one hit of sardines. Oh, sardines. That's where I went to the bank. It was easy to score free fish. I mean, hey, with this dolphin smile, yeah, it's illegal. No one cares. I got a monkey on my back. I'm not showing the people food. Hanging out in your boat, dodging props and hooks and doing dangerous stuff, stuff that uh, I'm ashamed to admit. Look, I know that I can kick this if people would just stop feeding me. So please feel free to share this. It's downloadable at don'tfeedwilddolphins.org. Um, share it with folks, use it to, to its best intent, and hopefully you can help make a difference. I thought the concept was kind of cute given the nature of the animals. There's bears, there's raccoons, there's gulls, there's other dolphins sitting around in a rehab setting. But you know, um, that's what you get when you, you work with a major advertising company. So. There are all the threats that I've talked about so far, and then there are the ones that you just don't predict. And by far the strangest one that we've encountered so far was when a dolphin that we'd already named Scrappy showed up with material on its back following one of the July 4th boat races. And he had this material on his back for a couple of weeks and it wasn't coming off. So we got permission from the National Marine Fisheries Service to go out and perform a rescue of, of Scrappy. And when we caught him, we found that what he'd been sporting was a very large speedo bathing suit, stretched out <laughs> to a great extent. Um, and one positive is that the material held up really well in salt water and sunlight for three weeks. <laughs> but you have to be careful because barnacles were growing in very bad places in there. It's a very soft material. Everybody knows what a speedo is. But even that soft material was able to cut an inch in on each side of the animal where the flippers attached to the body. It was just a fraction of an inch away from major blood vessels. If it had stayed on for a couple more days, the animal would have bled out and died. So even something as innocuous as that kind of a bathing suit can be dangerous. And then you don't even want to think about, well, what happened to the guy that was wearing it? Um, but fortunately, Scrappy has decided from that point forward to swim in the nude with all of his friends. And so there they go on. So our long-term work in Sarasota Bay is important for the dolphins of Sarasota Bay, but it also establishes a reference population for dolphins in other areas. In places where dolphins are suffering from unusual mortality events or environmental cata catastrophes, being able to understand what is harming those dolphins or what the impacts are in those dolphins in those affected areas can only be done through comparison. And so the comparison is using Sarasota as a reference population and comparing the data from Sarasota dolphins through their health, their reproduction, their survival to other sites. For example, Brunswick, Georgia, where there's four EPA Superfund sites related primarily to PCBs. Or North Carolina, where there was an unusual mortality event for morbillivirus. Or the Florida Panhandle, where there was a Brevitox, an unusual mortality event. Or, most dramatically, here where the Deepwater Horizon oil came ashore and did tremendous damage to the coastal waters. We were a major part of the Deepwater Horizon investigation and it was through comparisons with the Sarasota dolphins that NOAA was able to put together their assessment of how many dolphins were lost as a result of the Deepwater Horizon oil and the extent of the injuries to that population. Unfortunately, they had no up-to-date counts of the dolphins in Louisiana, Mississippi prior to the spill. It would have been a simple matter of going out counting afterwards. They didn't have that, so they had to do modeling. And then they had to try to extrapolate from analysis of the health of the dolphins about what health impacts might have come about from the Deepwater Horizon oil. And so by modeling their health assessments on the ones that we do here in Sarasota, they were able to, first of all, determine that dolphins did not vacate Barataria Bay, Louisiana. Uh, Barataria Bay is, is one of the closest areas to where the oil was coming from the Deepwater Horizon. They didn't leave that bay. Some of them might have, but there were still dolphins throughout the spill in Barataria Bay, meaning there was exposure to oil and to the other chemicals that came about. We found that there was 
low adrenal hormone levels in the dolphins of Barataria Bay, which is consistent with toxicity resulting from oil and associated chemicals. Uh, the most, one of the most significant findings had to do with lung disease. The dolphins in Sarasota Bay have great lungs. They're out there breathing and doing just fine. In Barataria Bay, they're five times more likely to have moderate to severe lung disease as in Sarasota Bay. And a lot of the, the volatile contaminants, toxic contaminants that are part of the mixture of oil and the cleanup solutions are expected to have impacts on lung tissue. There were a lot of other diseases that these animals in Barataria Bay were showing that you don't see normally elsewhere, but they're the kinds of things that experimental studies with other animals suggest you would see in association with exposure to oil. And then finally, in Sarasota Bay, we see 96% of our dolphins alive from one year to the next. In Barataria Bay, that was down to 87%. And in, I mentioned that pregnancy amount before, 83% of our pregnancies are successful. In Barataria Bay, it's 20%. This is not sustainable. So there were major damages from that, and the only way to know about those major damages was by having a normal population to compare to. And so our dolphins performed a great service relative to their brethren up in the northern Gulf of Mexico. Other things that impact these animals, some of them are not really visible. There are things similar to what Jocelyn did her master's thesis on, looking at environmental contaminants such as PCBs and DDT and residues. And even though we don't have any point sources of those contaminants here in the Sarasota Bay area, they've gotten to the area. They're present in the tissues, they're present in the sediments. Probably they came through airborne deposition as they were being released through incineration or any of a variety of other sources. But they make their way into the environment and from the environment, they make their way into the animals through the food chain. They get into the sediments, they go into the invertebrates, the fish eat the invertebrates the uh, invertebrates, the fish are eaten by the dolphins, and the dolphins accumulate these chemicals in especially their fatty tissues, in their blubber um, and their milk. So over time, what we've found is that in Sarasota Bay, we find contaminant concentrations, PCBs in particular, increasing in males with their age to the point where they're even off the chart up here. This dotted line is the hypothetical level at which you would expect to see health and reproductive impacts from PCBs. The males are over that, and they just keep getting more over that in time. And that may be one of the reasons why the males don't live as long as the females do. One of the impacts of these high levels of PCBs is on the immune system function. And if you destroy the immune system on these adult males, they're gonna be taken out by um, some of the, the pathogens that are in local waters. The females actually clean themselves out. They start out at high levels here, but once they give birth and start lactating, they then stay below that threshold. And this is a process called depuration, where the females shed their PCBs through their milk. This is, these are lipophilic chemicals. They bind with fats, and dolphin milk is very fatty. So the, the firstborn calf that a dolphin has gets 80% of what mother has accumulated throughout her life to that point. So over the first eight years of life, let's say, of a female, she's been accumulating contaminants. And she's a 400 pound female when she gives birth. She passes 80% of her accumulating contaminants to her 40 pound baby. And it could be a toxic level for that baby. And then once she does that though, and she loses that calf and gives birth to the next one a year or two later, there's only been a year or two to accumulate more contaminants. And that's not a toxic load. So the females are able to keep themselves cleaned out and below this threshold and their subsequent calves don't get as large a load. So we see firstborn survivorship of calves is not great uh, through the first year, but uh, subsequent calves have a much higher survivorship over time. And then other things that can be affecting these animals down the road that we need to watch, things like climate change. These animals live in a very warm water environment as it is already. There are times when the water temperature exceeds body temperature during the summertime. For these animals as perfectly good mammals to be able to maintain homeostasis, to be able to maintain their body temperature, they need to be able to dump heat to the environment. For them to dump heat, they have to have a heat gradient. It needs to be cooler in the water than it is in their body. If it's hotter, there's no place for that heat to go. The heat builds up and you get heat stress. As it is right now, we see much higher mortality of our dolphins in the summertime when the water temperatures are the highest 
than we do any other time of year. If these water temperatures increase, what's that going to do? Among the things we can think about it doing is that, first of all, it's going to limit the ability of the dolphins to cool, obviously, if they can't dump heat to the environment. Now what we see is that the dolphins actually have a higher metabolic rate in the summertime than in the wintertime, which was just the opposite of what I expected before we did the research. We, you look at the water temperature regime here in Sarasota Bay, and they live in waters that go from 55 degrees in the winter up to more than 90 degrees in the summertime. Water draws heat out of a body 25 times faster than air does. So I had always, I'm not a physiologist, but I'd always thought that winter would be tough for these animals to be able to maintain their body temperature. They do a great job of putting on blubber. They're able to insulate themselves to the point where their metabolic rate actually goes down in the winter time. They're, doing, they're really happy in terms of, of um, temperature regimes in the winter time. But in the summer time, their metabolic rate is higher they're trying to push heat to the, their skin to dump it to the environment. They're, the chemical reactions that create their skin are going like mad. Skin is a huge organ. And all of this is leading to a bad cycle of generating more heat than the animals can get rid of. So to support a higher metabolic rate, you've got to eat more food. If you're going to eat more food, you have to be able to catch that food. But if the water is warmer, if the pH regime is different, if the salinity is different, then you're going to have different prey species out there than what you're used to catching. So you're going to have to learn how to deal with that and hope that there's enough of them around to support you. You're already swimming in a soup of pathogens out there in the summertime. Water temperature at 95 degrees, there's lots of microorganisms, but these animals have an amazing immune system and they're able to fight off these microorganisms if all else is going well. But these new pathogens are going to be able to come in because of warmer waters and because it stays warmer throughout the year are ones that they may not be used to. So there's going to be a hit that comes from being exposed to new diseases that they can't fight. There's going to be an increase in the frequency and intensity of harmful algal blooms and also in hurricanes. All these things don't spell a very good future for the dolphins. People have said, well, they'll just move away. Everything we've seen here and elsewhere is that the dolphins don't do that. If they're resident dolphins to an area, they live in ec an ecological cul-de-sac. They don't go away when the red tide gets horribly bad. They don't go away when the oil comes into their community range. They don't go away when Hurricane Charlie destroys the habitat. Where are they going to go? These dolphins live in a mosaic up and down the coastline. Presumably all the other places where bottlenose dolphins can live have bottlenose dolphins living at the levels that the resources can support. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to take that long-lasting, long-established social system and insert it someplace else? The options are limited for these guys. So they're going to have to learn to adapt. And whatever we can do to give them more degrees of freedom to do that adapting will be very useful. So the things that we try to do to help out with that are the things that I've mentioned before. But we also try to engage in education. We bring interns through our program. We usually have about. Uh, 10 to 20 interns that work with us for two to four months a, a year, each year, and they come from all over the world. And we train them in our procedures, our protocols, and then they go back to wherever they came from, and hopefully they'll pursue an education that will lead them to be the conservation leaders of the future. The same with graduate students. Um, in 2016 alone, we had, what is that, um, 12 graduate students, or 11 graduate students and one senior thesis. Uh, that were completed or ongoing. Overall, we've had uh, about 70 different PhD or master's theses that were completed, and we're pleased to have one of those here in the room. Um, but these graduate students can then spread the word to their students and their graduate students, and so you build conservation capacity that can make a difference more widely. We're also called upon to assist and consult on a variety of environmental situations or, or management situations involving whales, dolphins, and porpoises around the world. And among the ones that we're engaged in most at this particular moment is this little animal right here. This little, do this little porpoise is called a vaquita. How many people here have heard of the vaquita porpoise? One, OK. Um, this little porpoise lives in the upper Gulf of California, or the Sea of Cortez, only. It was only discovered to science, or described to science, in 1958 by my major professor. Was, was Ken on your committee too? Yeah. OK, so a mentor for both of us was the scientist who discovered this species of porpoise 
1958, that's not that long ago. Today, there are fewer than 30 of them left on the face of the earth. And so they're being taken out in large, well, not large numbers now, but a high proportion of them are being lost to illegal fishing activities in the upper Gulf of California, where fishermen are going out to catch an endangered uh, drum called the totoaba. And they're catching this drum because they want the swim bladder from it. And they want the swim bladder from it because there's a market in China for the swim bladder to put it in as food supplements and medicines with the very, very false idea that it's going to do something to help them. And so this illegal market brings a price of as much as $5,000 per swim bladder, which is way more than a Mexican fisherman would make any other way. So this illegal fishery for an endangered fish has, is leading to the extinction of this porpoise. So we're involved in a project now with an international team to go down there in October and try to catch as many of the remaining porpoises as there are and put them into a sanctuary and hold them there until the Gulf of California is cleaned out for good of all of these illegal nets. It's a scary proposition. Trying to find these little bitty pins in this haystack is going to be really challenging. Nobody's ever tried to catch them to keep them alive. Nobody's ever maintained them. There's just a lot of questions. It should have started years ago if they were going to do it. So it's a last ditch effort to try to make a difference for this porpoise. But I'm hoping we can for a variety of reasons. And then we have what we do at home. We are, as conservationists, we're interested especially in population biology and maintaining populations, but you can't help but get attached to the individuals. We study them as individuals. We study them for their lifetimes. I know more dolphins from when I was in high school down here than I know people that are still in the area. <laughs> and so you get attached to them. And so we're called upon, because of our expertise in doing the health assessments, we're called upon to perform rescues. So we go out and we catch these animals, or sometimes we can remove the, the gear remotely, but most of the time it involves briefly catching them, taking the gear off, and then releasing them on site. And so typically there's one or two of those that we have to do a year. But that's one or two animals that wouldn't be out there if we didn't go to the effort of doing that. And of course they all get names. So I thank you for caring about the animals. There's some information on what you can do to have a good time out on the water and still protect the animals out on the table out here. And I'll pick up the leftovers from you later on. But help yourself to those. And if I have time, I'm happy to take questions. You mentioned the body temperature of the dolphin and how it's affected by the water. How does the body temperature of a dolphin like compare it to ours, or is it how different is it? Body temperature of dolphins is very similar to ours. Mm -hmm. Um, it's different in terms of how they're able to, to regulate it because of the blubber layer that they have and their circulation system and, and other factors, but it is very similar to ours. Okay. Are dolphins and porpoises worldwide? Yeah. Great, qu great question. Yes. Nope, sorry. The question was, are dolphins and porpoises worldwide? And there are. There's, um, I forget the, the changes as scientists are identifying different different species, but there's something like 35 species of dolphins and six or seven species of porpoises around the world. In Sarasota Bay, we're only going to see bottlenose dolphins, but then right. bottlenose dolphins are found through warm, temperate waters around the world. There are other dolphins, like killer whales, that will go from pole to pole, basically, and as well as all the waters in between. Are all the dolphins and porpoises territorial? By territorial, I'm assuming you mean that they have a range that they maintain yes. as opposed to defending an area against others, right. and, which is the, the technical behavioral term. It depends. Some of them are migratory. Even within a species, you'll find that they're migratory for bottlenose dolphins. The ones along the Atlantic seaboard will range as far as Massachusetts and um, New Jersey during the summertime, but they migrate down to Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina during the wintertime. So, but as you get into the warmer parts of the species range, they become more resident to that area. And then there are forms of bottlenose dolphins that live out of the open ocean as well. We've been studying ones out in Bermuda, um, right out here, and there are dolphins out there that we've tracked throughout the entire Sargasso Sea. Um, we're just beginning to learn about their ranging patterns. These animals have been around for 12 million years. We've been around 2 million years. They've learned a lot of different ways of doing things over time, we're just beginning to, to 
figure out the patterns that they're capable of exhibiting. Do any of the um, dolphins in this area or warmer areas migrate north like the people going back to Michigan? <laughs> the dolphins in Sarasota don't migrate. They're year-round residents. We don't know what happens out in the Gulf waters immediately offshore. We're hoping to start a project out there to put satellite link transmitters on some of those and give it, get a better sense of their movements with whatever environmental factors might be driving that. Okay. But they're probably not migratory in most of the Gulf of Mexico. Last question. Uh, you mentioned their prey species. Um, would snook, redfish, trout be in? Yeah. Yeah, they, they like their snook. Um, <laughs> and trout yeah. especially. Redfish not quite so much, but, but sea trout is one of the top ten. Snook isn't in the top ten, but it's one that they, we do see them with fairly mm -hmm. frequently. And their natural predators would only be sharks and rays? Well, the, the only predator they have are sharks, especially bull sharks. We have a PhD student who's looking into that in, in more detail now. The rays are not really a predation, they're an unintended consequence. Mm -hmm. um, I started working at Moat Marine Laboratory in 1970, and at that time it was the world's premier shark laboratory, and they were catching sharks quite often. While I was working at Moat was when the movie Jaws came out, and all of a sudden, everybody became a shark fisherman. Everybody wanted to clear the waters and make them safe for people to swim. And that single movie probably did more to harm shark conservation than anything else. Shark populations were dramatically reduced in coastal waters that continued through fishing and bycatch and that sort of thing. But they've not yet recovered from all of that. One of the things that sharks do is eat rays. So if you remove sharks from the waters, it's logical to assume the ray population are going to increase. We've seen what we think is an increase in the encounter rate between dolphins and rays, not because the rays are chasing down the dolphins, but because our dolphins swim through very shallow water. And if they bump the bottom as they're doing that, the ray is going to think it's going to have to defend itself. And so it's just an increase in encounter rate leads to more barbs going into dolphins, which leads to more mortalities and serious injuries. If there were more sharks around, wouldn't be the same issue. So there's trade-offs. Turtle lady in the back, yes. <laughs> um, so the transmitters that you put on them, how, what, what's the, how many days or hours, or what do you get out of the transmitters? Let's see if I have a picture of one here. Yeah, uh, well, I don't. You can't see it very well. There's a little transmitter on this Franciscana right here. Okay. It's about this big, yep. and it's attached by a single plastic pin to the trailing edge of the fin. It yep. has a single AA battery in it. And if it's a location-only tag that's sending us just a location signal up right. to the satellite, we have gotten as much as eight months wow. out of that. If it's one that also tells us how deep the animals are diving and how long they're staying down, it's more like two to three months. So the right. message is longer. The, it just uses up the battery that much more quickly. But they've come a long ways over the decades. It's amazing what can happen now. For me to be sitting in my office down here and tracking an animal as it's moving around the Sargasso Sea, it's pretty amazing. We're putting one of those tags on a pilot whale that's been rehabbed at SeaWorld, and it'll be released in the Gulf of Mexico on Monday. And I'm very excited to see about where it's going to go. So. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to welcome Susie Fox from Island Turtle Watch as our next speaker. Yay. Did I go the wrong way? I'm notorious for going the wrong way, mostly in the night on the nesting beaches. <laughs> so Anna Maria Island Turtle Watch um, monitors 11.7 um, kilometers of nesting beaches. Um, we are the only place in the, floor, in the state of Florida and probably the United States that has bayside nesting. You can see that nice white beaches on the Gulf, and we have a huge bunch of nesting habitat on the backside. Matter of fact, back in 1990, uh, 1990, I guess, when I started Turtle Watch, that was my beat. I was the Bayside girl. If we found three nests, we were pretty excited. The whole nest had 40, the whole um, island had 47 
um, nests back in the early days in the 80s. So to find three on the base side, I was pretty excited. This past year, from the Rod and Rail Pier to Bean Point, we have had 40 eight nests, I believe, on, in just that area. So that's how much nesting has gone up. And the biggest reason is habitat. We've gained habitat. So Anna Marie Island Turtle Watch is staffed by volunteers. We have a little over 100 volunteers that walk the nesting beaches from May to October. Every morning on the beach, <laughs> they get up way before dawn. They're supposed to be able to see their toes in the sand before they start out and they have to be on the beach in the dark. They get going and they uh, walk a one mile section. They're surveying for nests that have been laid the night before um, uh, uh, from the uh, moms that have come in, mostly loggerheads. We do have a few greens. And they are looking for the crawls that the mothers left. They aren't looking for the mothers themselves. So this is definitely a nest. Um, I can t my, any of my volunteers can tell you what species made this crawl. They can tell you that it was a loggerhead. She came in on the left side of your picture here, did her little business there where that nice fluffy sand is, and turned around and exited back out to sea. This is a perfect crawl, except one little thing I'm seeing. I'm not good with a clicker, so I'm going to point. Um, these little marks right here, she was missing a part of her back flipper. And they usually will tell us that, too, when, we, when they turn in this report. And so turtles come in and go directly out to sea unless they've had a little problem, like a run in with a chair or lighting problems. I see a nice dark beach here. In and back out. In crawl and out crawl. Very good. Um, here she ran into some rocks. Well, the bay side is, has a huge seawall that runs all along it. Also, people have dumped some rocks to hold in their houses because... Well, I know in 1990, when that was my beat back there, the water was up to the back of the houses. So you could see seawalls coming up, being built higher back into there, trying to protect their home. I don't blame them. Um, however, this turtle did come in. She ran into the rocks and still nested there. They're very crafty back there on the base side. So this is a fun picture from Palm Beach. Somebody was up in a high rise there. Obviously, we don't have many high rises here in Anna Maria. So turtle comes in. This is one turtle. It happened... Is that a green turtle, Annie? Yep, it's a green turtle. Boy, um, I haven't seen this picture up close. So she came in, tracked all over the beach. She ran into chairs and chairs and made some different decisions, dug a couple of, uh, gee, what am I going to do? Am I going to maybe here, maybe here, maybe here, maybe here, maybe here. Look at all the volunteers out running around trying to figure out which way she came in. She did finally nest. I think her nest is right up here. Here's another nest from another turtle at another time. So lots of crawling around on the beach out there. That's why it's really important to pull your lawn chairs up on the beach at night. She's got enough obstacles out there all on her own. You know, the, a mother, when she's coming in to have her babies, you know, she needs to come in and go back out. She doesn't want to be playing with anything on the nesting beaches. Uh, one thing about taking pictures in the sea turtle world, we don't take good pictures because we're directly into the sun on this side of the state. The, the, um, but it does take the best photos because we can catch the shadows of the tracks going in and out. So this was a green turtle on our beach a few weeks back. Um, green turtles are notorious for nesting up in the dune. They love, love, love the dune line. So up she goes, and uh, actually her, her track going out was on the other side of the lifeguard tower. This is down at Coquina Beach. Um, I'd like to tell you that Marv is standing in that, but he's actually kneeling. But they nest so deep that we are holding on to each other's toe. Lee's legs are actually hanging down into the, the pit that the green turtles make. Very interesting there. Green turtles have a poke and a drag because their tail hangs out in the back end, unlike a loggerhead. So green turtles move with all of their flippers simultaneously moving at the same time. Loggerheads move their flippers like we walk. So it's, a, it's like a baby would crawl on the ground. And we also have false crawls. That's where a turtle comes in to nest and decides, nope, false labor tonight, and back out to see she goes. You should have an equal number of false crawls to nest. We have uh, about 470 
nests on the beach right now, and we have a little over 425 false crawls, a little bit low in false crawls. We're okay with that. Last year, we had double the amount of false crawls as we did nests. It seemed to be happening all over the United States. When we all got together and put our data together, we were noticing that we had, um, every, we had higher numbers all over the United States of loggerhead nesting, and we had double, every, everyone had double the amount of false crawls. So uh, this turtle came in, dug her body pit, that's dug with her back flippers, every turtle digs them with their back flippers, and abandoned the attempt to nest. That is an abandoned up body, uh, egg cavity, and the only reason she would do that is if she got disrupted on the beach. Only reason. Raccoon, people, Lightning, probably not. She'll, she'll nest in lightning. Um, I'd say human interaction. If we find a spot that has too many of those, we go out with a police officer at night and set out there with night vision goggles and find out what's going on. Something's happening out there and we need to make sure that we get that taken care of so that she can nest properly. <clears throat> we don't pull the eggs out of the egg cavity when we find them. We do have to locate them because we're gonna drive stakes in there to mark them off but we don't actually pull an egg out. We will clear the area around when we have a lot of people to show them, but it gets covered back up. So we do have to go in and find and locate where the eggs are in every nest. Another egg cavity. This is down at Coquina Beach. It is the only place on the island that has a uh, pred predation problem. The only pred predator that we have on the island is raccoons. Um, it's much better than it used to be. The only place was Coquina Beach, much better because they changed the trash barrels. Kind of like with bears. You know, everybody, you know, we needed, or someone decided we needed to go out and shoot the bears because they were coming up to the houses, change the trash bins. So for about 10 years, Charlie Hunsinger and I have been working on different trash barrels down at Coquina Beach. The last five years has made the difference finally. Um, they've stepped up county trash removal and they changed the garbage cans. So we just don't have the problem that we used to down there. Longboat Key still does, I'll tell you that. <laughs> they need to change their trash cans. So when a raccoon does get in, <clears throat> they love when, you f when the turtle first nests, whatever's going on inside those eggs in the first nesting attempts, they love eating all the little, well, it's like scrambled eggs. So in they go, they leave all the little pieces behind. A lot of times when we can't locate eggs and we just have to place these restraining cages or uh, uh, self-releasing cages over the top of them, if we don't get the cage on right, they go in and they'll dig out the side and they kind of show us where we've missed on the, on the um, nesting down there and getting that cage over the top. Very, very important to get that cage. I can tell you now that I think last year we might have had one raccoon get into a nest and there was a time when 50 nests on Coquina Beach, not one of them hatched because of raccoons. Very happy with that. Many people believe that we go out and watch turtles on the beach, and we don't watch turtles on the beach. We collect the data, and the data part is what's going to be, data collection part of this program is what's going to save sea turtles. On this island, we started this program in 1982. The life of a sea turtle from the time that she can have the eggs, about the age of 35, um, until now, it's, it's a, like a 35 year cycle. So we believe that the turtles that were laid here 35 years ago are probably coming back home. And we proved that with Eliza Ann. We satellite tagged a turtle in June and she has come back twice. It's the first time that we've absolutely proven that the same turtle has nested on this island three different times and a loggerhead can nest up to eight different times. So we know that they come back, we know that they come back home now, and each time she picked Anna Marie Island, she could have went down to Sarasota County or she could have went up to Egmont Key or um, up to Paso Girl Beach, but she picked home again. So that little hump up there is a little turtle doing her business. You can see the, um, we stand 50 feet away and quiet, and this is just, just after dawn in the morning. Normally this would be done at night, Pictures of uh, turtles come out of a, a, we have a cutaway nest out there too, a little bit different than that. They come out as a community. It takes a community to raise sea turtles, just like on Anna Maria Island, but also to come out of the nest. They all have to climb over the top of each other and work their way up 
from the bottom and out the top of the nest. Um, uh, this is one of our nests, actually, one of our adoptive signs. And little indent in the bottom shows us that uh, turtles have exited there and ran to the sea. Lee Zirkel in the back, one of the volunteers at Coquina Beach. Um, normally, we don't have that many nests in a row, although this year we kind of do. We got a lot of nests on the beach. Um, when turtles exit out, they leave a little track, and the volunteers can tell you if a nest is hatched, unless there's been rain, by these little tracks coming out. So we, we need to know that they went right to the sea, that they weren't held up by anything, anyone, on their way to the sea. So little tracks, little baby tracks, look just like mama tracks. Little baby. Baby. Gr that was a green turtle, by the way. See the, the um, little white all the way around? That's a green baby. Baby going to sea, baby's going to sea. So once a nest hatches out under our federal permits, we wait three days and we go into that nest and take everything out. Hatched, unhatched, dead, live, half in and out of eggs, dead or live, that's called pipped. And we count. They, um, some volunteers put them in little piles of 10. Every egg that is over 50% still there is counted as one hatched egg. If it is under, like a little chip of an egg, you can't make a little pieces parts pile and say, oh, I think there's about 30. Because there's 3,000 of us counting in the state of Florida, and we have to be consistent. That's one thing, and Randy would back me up. In science, you have to have consistency in your data gathering. It's because there's so many people doing it. Very, very important. So one of the threats, when the there's two threats on Anna Maria Island. One is, is leaving out chairs and any objects on the beach at night that turtles can get stuck in. I'll tell you that we did take this with a flash, flash camera. I will tell you that. Not done often, but I needed a picture of this to prove to the owner of this resort that he has done this time and time again. And he did. And he wasn't really happy about that. And then he, he challenged me to put it in the paper, and we did. He hasn't done that since. So uh, this turtle, is that chair is not as wide as that turtle, and that turtle nested there. There is eggs underneath her. When she went back to sea, she dragged the chair, and two of my volunteers were on the beach that night, and they lifted the chair, or that mother would have dragged that chair all the way to the water, and the chair is so heavy, she has to come up for air. That would have killed that turtle. So stuff left on the beach at night, and lighting. Now, um, we have sea turtle-friendly bulbs that... Every fixture in this room, we, I could retrofit this. It'd be just about as bright as here. Maybe not quite as bright. But um, you could see, you could read under them. So there's bulbs that we can put in. There's um, styles of fixtures. Every single light in the world can be sea turtle friendly. There's no excuse. This little cage here <coughs> is a self, or is a, it's a self-containing cage. When I know I cannot get a light out and a Cortez Road, I have permission from Fish and Wildlife, because we work under these state permits, to put a cage over the top. That cage also had a dark cloth over the top. The minute I pulled that dark cloth off, off that cage in the morning, and I lightened this picture, by the way. This is pretty dark when we took this. All the turtles ran to the side where the light was. So um, we open up the little top and put them into little buckets. And uh, these turtles have to go back at night because they've been running around inside that cage for a while and they've used up all their energy. So we needed to let them sleep until nighttime in the dark, take them to a very, very dark spot, and release them and allow them to walk through the sand, which, causes, which is one of, the, one of the only lessons that they need to learn on land is to imprint in that sand. And it tells the males and the females, this is home. When they walk through the sand, they put their little... Uh, chin down in that sand and it tells them this is your home so they have to walk through the sand of the sea but I can tell you I picked the hatchlings out of this this um, cage right here and put them in that bucket I got home I could not get them to go to sleep they were moving and moving and moving I'm like please please the dogs were barking I'm like I called my neighbor I'm like I can't get these to go to sleep can you take them at your house and see if it would happen she said well just put them in the car and drive them around the block a couple of times and I'm like <laughs> No way. She said, yeah, just go ahead and do it. I'm driving around. I got the windows down. I'm listening to music. Pretty soon I'm listening. 
they all went to sleep just like a baby. So it, it works. It works just on sea turtles. It works on everything. So when they get to running around the beach, if I had not put that cage on, we'd find all these little marks, not going directly down to the beach, but going around in little circles. It's called a disorientation. We got a bunch of those in Holmes Beach right now. We're trying to work with a code officer. Needs a little more training. We're working on it, though. So in uh, 2010, was that the Deepwater Horizon year? It was. I received grant money. They had killed so many turtles in the Gulf of Mexico that they were coughing up money, big money, that had to save, turtle hab save turtles in any way they could. The rehabbing of what was still ill from the Gulf oil spill or habitat. So the people who administrated that money was the Sea Turtle Conservancy, the license plate that you see. And they came here because we worked with them for years. And they said, let's go ahead and set this up on your island first. Lucky me. Always, always do nice things like cook them dinner and house them. They love that. So I took all the grant people and we, this was our first building we did. This is Gulf Shores at 56, 5700. And um, that's how light it was. Looks good, looks like yellow lighting. I mean, sea so turtles can't see yellow light, but they're lighting the walls of their stairwells. Like, you don't need to light this. You need to light this. And so we showed them how we retrofitted everything with bulbs that are sea turtle friendly and fixtures are sea turtle friendly. And you think, oh my God, this building's so dark. How do they see inside? You could read a newspaper in here. So the people are very happy. They love it. Um, they can see it's a nice amber glow. These are amber PAR 20 bulbs a little bit more expensive. Their common area um, uh, cost of lighting their building went down 70%. God, it's a gimme. You know, cheap bulbs are a little more expensive. They last um, six to eight years. Some of these, these bulbs are the same bulbs we put in the building. So that's 10 years ago. No, well, seven, eight, seven years ago. <clears throat> so we really, 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 really want to tell people about retrofitting their, you know, the fixtures on their buildings. That's the biggest thing that has killed sea turtles on Anna Maria Island is lighting. Not flashlights, not, um, what else, not holes on the beach, not going to kill them. Lighting. So this is my worst pet peeve, wish lanterns. Don't tell me if you've ever let off a wish lantern, but don't do it again. They say on the package, eco-friendly, they are not. That is a bamboo um, cord, I've had this one in my house for eight years. And that thing is in my backyard and it's still hanging from the tree in my backyard. It does not go away. The paper goes away, but that other thing, that's forever. They can tell you anything they want on those packages. Don't believe them. Now, I understand there's a statute in the state of Florida. They are illegal. You can fill in your holes. We don't want to fall into them either. Um, rent only from places that are, do sea turtle friendly lighting. I need my clicker. We came up with this really cool little feature. I got a bunch of these. You guys can all walk out with them. When I look at the, the bulbs in this room, I can see them. When I go to the LED red light in that sign, it disappears. You guys all need to play with these when you get up. I got one for everybody. You can look at any of the lights at your neighbor's house if you're renting, and you can tell if they're sea turtle friendly. Sea turtle friendly bulbs will not be able to be seen through this little turtle eye, we call it. So we've, we've come up with a lot of tools that the renters can use and that the residents can use. If you encounter a turtle on the beach, don't take a photo, don't turn on a flashlight, stand 50 to 100 feet away and be very, very quiet. Pick up all the trash, of course, that's a gimme. And, and take all your toys on the beach home at night. Even if you have a rental where you think you own all that land on down to the water, you might, but still take home your stuff at night. So we, we go into the schools. We have very, a, a bunch of very, very fun programs. We worked with the Anna Maria Island Middle School kids, and we made up these cards here. They have um, notation, or, uh, little um, lines that tell that they're from the school on the back, Anna Maria Island Turtle Watch. We did it with third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders, and there's eight cards in each of those. We made up a double batch, and the school started selling them and raised a bunch of funds for different things that our local school needed here. We also do a lot of um, public awareness, public outreach. I think I printed 11 new brochures for the rentals and for the residents. 
I have bunches of them here. Uh, we give turtle talks every week uh, uh, during the summertime. So we do a lot of outreach. In 1990, no, let's see, no, it's 2006, the education program picked up in Turtle Watch, and that's where the difference started, was when we start educating the public. So education was the key, and we try to do different things every year. A lot of our, our funding that we raise goes into printing and building these programs. The other thing we do is we do stranding and salvaging. When we find a sick or an injured sea turtle on the shoreline, we do a triage in the field to find out what's going on. Then we start calling facilities to transport um, mostly sea turtles, although we've done some dolphins um, and birds, and get them to the facility that can take them for whatever disease we're seeing in the field. We also have a bird stewarding program. <laughs> we have black skimmers that have nested in front of the 5400 Club in Holmes Beach. Residents weren't too happy with that. I did give them a 30-foot walkway to walk on through in between the birds, but the birds thought otherwise, and now they've nested in the middle of the walkway. <laughs> I tried. <clears throat> so um, we do bird stewarding through the summer. This little snowy plover, we've had three successful snowy plover nests this year, each hatching three little chicks. We're very excited about that. When I started um, uh, doing the bird program in 2005 here on the island, there were 47 pair of the uh, snowy plovers in the state of Florida on the west coast. So we're way up now. And that, that's data collection. Again, that all goes for data collection. Black skimmers are the ones that are nesting at the 5400 Club right now. Um, last count, and it goes up every week, there was uh, 67 chicks that had hatched out of um, 200, there's 212 adults, so about 100 nests. Oh, they're cute. They're just getting ready to fly. They have flying lessons. They have to have fishing lessons. Fishing lessons are kind of fun. Got to learn how to, how to live, how to eat, how to fly. And Eliza Ann. I want to tell you about Eliza Ann. We satellite tagged a turtle this year with our partners, the uh, partner program. We're community partners with the Waterline Resorts. We're very excited. It's the first time in the history, in 30-some years of uh, doing anything on Anna Maria Island for Anna Maria Island Turtle Watch, we have a community partner. And they are very good with, the, with um, taking care of their places. They have two different places here on the island. Um, second one is just opening up, so we want them to be environmentally friendly. And also, they came up with a $5,000 to buy us a satellite tech, so we're really happy with them. We have been watching Eliza Ann since the middle of June. We know she came back and nested two other times other than her, her initial because we had the satellite tag. We never would have known that without the satellite tag. She was the biggest turtle I've ever seen in all of my 30 years of doing this was Eliza Ann. And um, we had to stay out on the beach all night and locate her. We did have two other loggerheads at the time. We, she was down at Coquina and we just felt it was a good spot. We had to clean her back. Um, dry her off, and then attach that satellite tag. It isn't as small as Randy's tags. I'm thinking, boy, that battery in there, that'd be nice if we could get them as small as that, but on the back of a loggerhead, it's a little bit harder. Um, I don't know what our count is on days now. We're over a month, obviously, but our last tag that we did 10 years ago was uh, 197 days. But this one, I mean, we're just having a blast watching her. And you can go on the Sea Turtle Conservancy site and look up Eliza Ann, and you can watch wherever she's going all around the Gulf. There she is, Sea Turtle Conservancy. She's in a program called Tour de Turtles. And you look up Tour de Turtles, it's really a cute little program. You can follow her around. Ginny's and Janie's helps us out by selling um, our T-shirts. They take in a donation and donate the entire money back to uh, Anna Maria Island Turtle Watch. We're happy with that. So questions, anybody? Questions, questions. I can really run through. I can talk a mile a minute, can I? Oh, I want to tell you one thing about our Adopt-A-Nest program. Here's a sign that comes off the nesting beaches. You get, to, um, you get to put your name on a sign. It goes on the nest when the nest is first laid, and it stays on the nest all the way through until the end, and then when the volunteers <laughs> Um, uh, excavate the nest, they write in the field all your little goodies. So I send this to you in a package afterwards. All the sand from the plaque goes back in the package along with all of our little handouts. So it's a cool thing. This is a huge fundraiser for our program. You can go online and adopt yourself a nest. You can do it as 
birthday presents. We're going to close the adoption in another month or so for 2017, and then we'll reopen it in a few months after we get these all sent out. So you can do it for Christmas presents, Easter gifts, holiday, th any holiday. You can adopt a nest. Very cool. So questions, anybody? Questions, questions. Um, what do turtles eat and what eats turtles? Turtles eat loggerheads, eat just about anything. They love fish and crabs, and um, they're not so into the grasses, although they well eat them occasionally. Green turtles are, are um, yeah, they are. They, it, although they have been known to eat other things as well, um, if they aren't getting enough of the liquids in through the plant life that they're eating, they will eat little shrimp and stuff to make sure they get the liquids in. What eats a turtle? We have seen big bites out of them, I'm guessing from sharks. I don't know if they really know. The, wor the hardest thing on a sea turtle is us. And, and that is going down, down, down on this island because of the education and the way you guys are doing everything. So it's, it's made a huge difference with what's happening here on Anna Maria Island in the big turtle world. Yeah. You never see any Kemp's Ridley or Leatherbacks? or No. Uh, Kemp's, yes. When alive, I have, but not nesting. They were right. sick, and the Leatherback that came in in the year 2000, uh, she was sick. It was the first Leatherback I had seen in my life. I thought, well, the police called me and told me it was a whale. And as I was walking up to her, I thought, it looks like a whale. And it, was, it had um, monofilament around one of her flippers. So um, a Clearwater Aquarium bought a big step van down, and we actually surgically removed the flipper in the parking lot at Manatee Public Beach, or she would have died right away. And she lived quite a ways af quite a while after that, but um, those are the only two times I've seen uh, any other species here. Okay. Um, let's see. In Grand Cayman, they keep turtles up to a year or more. Um, yeah. What, what's the, uh, out of all the hatchlings, like 100 hatchlings, how many will may survive and come back? Well, uh, uh, great question. Um, in our lifetime, we have two beautiful children, and that's all we need to carry on our name and do fabulous things for us. This mom lays five to 800 in a season, and she's hoping to get one out of that. So when, peop when, you, when I say to you, 5,000 and some turtles nested out, or are, have left our sea already and went to the ocean, 5,329, we're hoping to get five out of that. So if anybody says, oh my God, we've got so many hatchlings here, we're gonna be overrun. No, you're not. And what eats them on the way out is fish. Um, yeah, I mean, Randy's dolphins, I get, everybody's gotta eat. So we, we're okay with nature doing that. We're okay with storms doing that. We're not okay when man forgets to turn out a light. Any other cool questions? Yes. Does the red tide or the temperature change have as much effect on turtles as it did as the gentleman before spoke about dolphins? It does, and I, I loved when Randy said that. There were so many correlations. Yes, red tide because they breathe in some water, you know, some water comes in and goes through their lungs. So yes, on red tide, and it makes them sick, sick to their tummies. And a lot of times they can't keep eating properly after that. And the other, um, heat, yes, because everything about a sea turtle is about temperature. The moms um, nest in the April in a certain temperature. They come on shore when the t water temperature reaches 80 degrees. Then when the ha after she nests out there, low nests are the cooler nests. They're closer, or yeah, cooler nests, higher nests, are the um, female nests, and they're up toward the shoreline, and they're warmer. So the lower nests are the guys, the higher nests are the girls. So of course we call it hot chicks and cool dudes. But when, we, when that starts to become unbalanced, just what Randy was saying, we're gonna change some things. So we gotta be careful about the temperature. Very, very cautious about climate change. Any other questions? We good? Yes? We were at the Bayfront Bay Park today, <laughs> and I noticed somebody dragged one of the picnic tables way down close to the water, mm -hmm. so much so that it was like slanted. Yeah. It was high tide. The, the, I don't think they should have done that. They shouldn't have. And you know, anytime anybody sees anything, you can, out here, you, if you know the police number that isn't the emergency number, you certainly can die. Or out here, mm -hmm. you may dial 911 and say, 
you know, I'm seeing something that isn't right, and I'd like a police officer to call me. All the police departments tell me to do that. Okay. And you just tell them, and somebody will come down and drag that back. That's okay. very good. Thanks Maybe for we noticing leave, we'll go that. See if nobody dragged it back yet. There you go. Okay. Very good. All right. All right. I think we're good. And I've got a lot of handouts, and I hope to have none of them when you leave. So the little turtle eyes, um, I'm going to put them out on that table, or I'll, I'll have Annie do it. And I want everybody to take a turtle eye and go look at your neighbor's lights. <laughs> and so out, outside, uh, we have a whole bunch of things that Susie brought with her to, to show you. So uh, feel free to go on out there. And Thank you very much. Yes, I will.